All right, let me hear the sound level. Just tell her your name and what year you're, uh, what you're studying and what year you are. My name is Rana Peralta. I am a fifth year student senior. Okay, and I am a cell and molecular biology major. Okay, let's do it one more time. Um, my name is Rana Peralta. I am a cell and molecular biology major and I am a senior. Okay. okay hold on just one second. Are you going to use that? Yes, oh. Again? No, I don't think so. Do you want him to do it again? Do you want nah. him to say it better? Nah. <laughs> this I like how I said it. This is for Raquel. So say it one more time for my her. My name is Ronald Peralta. And I am a cell and molecular biology major senior. There you go. Okay. <laughs> so we're good to go. Um, remember that, remember how I told them yes. to include the question? Yes. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but also to include the question in your answer, in your own yes. words. Allow a little time in between the questions in case he thinks of something else he wants to add. Okay. So you don't jump on each other's words. And how long should I, how long should the answers be? Oh, it just, let him just talk. Okay. Well, we don't cut them off. Okay. Perfect. Usually it's harder to get them to say more. So you just, yeah. you just, it's one, like you start recording until the end. Yeah. And yeah, then and, unless we really need to stop and Perfect. start, you know. Okay. All right, go ahead. All right. Ronald, what was your original plan, career goal, or reasons when you enrolled in a science degree at John Jay? Initially, when I came to John Jay, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. It was as random as I came here because it was the shortest commute. That's it. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Why did you decide to apply to prison? I decided to join PRISM in, I think, the summer of 2014. I had a friend who had joined PRISM previously and he was conducting research and I thought it was interesting. And it was like, a, if I'm interested in science, maybe I should explore this avenue of research. So since you were interested in research, how have your research experiences changed the way that you view the world? So. Now, as, sorry, I'll start over. Yeah, this has to be very, I mean, you can't, you know, like, make it more conversational and include. Okay. Include, and she said, ask for an experience. If you can think <clears throat> of, like, tell me a story. Tell me a story about Fantastic. doing an experiment. And Which then one? how that affects, it doesn't matter. Choose so something. So the second that, answer was good? Yeah, all those were good, but just now she asked you. Okay. Is there, what, did, what was the question? How have your research experiences, experiences All right, changed let me think the way of an you view experience. the world? Yeah, some experience and tell the story. Um, but we're talking about PRISM specifically, right? Yeah. All right. How do I see, I, can I just talk about how it's changed me instead of seeing the world? Because like my research experience doesn't have much, like it's more environmental, right? So it's like, it's not much about Right, but that's okay because it's changing the way that you view the world, right? Okay. It, by, All right. by changing Fair. you. So the, the way that I feel that my research experience has changed how I view the world is just how little things can have drastic effects. I work with mercury and just the tiniest amount of mercury can have drastic effects in a human system. So that's how I see the world now. We don't take into consideration all the things that can affect us, but microbes. Everything is important and everything affects us in our life. That's great. I'm going to do it one more time and I'm just going to change the size of the frame that I have. Okay. <clears throat> can you move your chair just a tiny bit this way? Oh boy, this is a challenge. Just put, pick it up. Oh, good job. They're very precise, I can tell. All right, so. All right. Say that one more time. The way that my research experiences have changed the way I see the world is how small uh, tiny amounts of things can like have an effect on you. For example, I work with mercury and mercury is extremely detrimental for health. So a small amount of methylmercury can probably kill the person. So the way I see the world now is be careful. You don't know what you're taking in. Read everything and try not to die. I fucked up. <laughs> no, you didn't. That was good. We can use part of the first time yeah. you answered it and part okay, of the so second time. I, you want I, to say it one more time for I me? can do what Donovan was doing where he like kind of went back and then started. 
Yeah, I sure. What, what did I say? You were, you were talking about mercury. Yeah. And uh, the smallest okay. thing, how it can affect. A so I'll go back to methyl mercury. Methyl mm -hmm. mercury. So in my lab, we work with mercury, not specifically methyl mercury, but methyl mercury, at the tiniest amount, can kill the person. So the way I see the world now differently is that I need to be careful with what I consume, and I try to be healthier now. There you go. There you go. Very interesting. Okay. So, is there any particular PRISM experience, not necessarily <clears throat> research, but PRISM, that's changed how you view or perceive yourself as a person or as a scientist? Whether it's going to a workshop or going to a conference or presenting your research at a conference or anything like that. Okay, let's see. How I see myself. Mm -hmm. as, a, as a person or as a scientist? Okay, so um, being in PRISM has given me a lot of opportunities to go to conferences and different places and it can it serves as a tool where you can communicate with people, network with people, and see that you are capable of being a scientist. And that's the thing that I've enjoyed the most. It's You get a validation from going to these places and people telling you it's not the same bubble that you're in all the time. It's a different group of people that are telling you that you are capable of doing the work. And I feel validated when I go to these places. Do you feel like PRISM has prepared you? We have to have open-ended questions. How do you feel? How do you feel the PRISM mm -hmm. has prepared you for those experiences? I feel that PRISM has prepared me very well for these experiences because before we go to these trips and these events, they train us uh, how to present, even though by this time I've heard it like six times. But the first time when you get the training, you go to these boot camps. You, they tell you which forks to use, and it's just it's a lot of fun, and PRISM does a lot so that we can uh, succeed in these places. Oh, okay, so when you finished that sentence, you started to clean your teeth with your tongue. Okay. Which is very distracting. All right. So let's answer that question one more time. So when I finished. Okay, so one of the things that I like the most about PRISM, was that a good way to say it? Like, or wasn't it about preparing you? Preparing. Yeah, so how, okay. how, how has PRISM prepared you for these experiences? <clears throat> so I feel that PRISM has prepared me for these experiences at, sorry, I'll go back. I feel that PRISM has prepared me for conferences and uh, professional events because before we go, we attend these events. We know that we're going to present, so they train us on how to present, how to answer questions. They also train us on how to get the information we want from conferences. Uh, for example, we went to Abercams and Sackness, and before we had boot camps, how to present, what questions we should be looking for, what graduate schools we should be looking at. I feel like PRISM prepares us very well in that aspect. Great. Did I clean my teeth again? No. No. Okay. So at PRISM, we don't train lab techs. We train scientists. How have you become a scientist? Okay. So I feel that PRISM has trained me to become a scientist because I have been able to uh, lead my own research. Stop. That's so rehearsed. Yeah. You know, use, make your own words. Think about okay. that question. Okay. Take it in. And how do you say the same thing but with different words? What was the question? So that, at PRISM, we don't train lab techs, okay. we train scientists. How have you become a scientist? Is it in the way mm -hmm. that you think about things? Yeah, I, I know how I'm answer. I'm just thinking about how to say it in a different way where it doesn't sound like a robot. Okay. During my time in the lab, I have been able to design protocols. I have been able to conduct my own experiment, my own hypothesis-driven experiment, where I think about the experiment, and I do my projects. I do all of my sample analysis. I do everything for my project. That's how, that's why I feel that I'm a scientist. I think critically about what I'm doing, and I am not just another person in the lab following direction. Whoa, you nailed it. That's yeah. exactly the kind of yeah. thing that we're looking for. Yeah. That's yeah. perfect. Next. Okay, so why or how did you choose your mentor? And what does your mentor mean to you? What does okay. Anthony Carpi so mean to you? So Carpi was random. Is it good to say random? Like, he was just the first person that I went to. And I was like, I like you. You're nice. That's it. I'm well, you can you. say that you, and I'm not trying to feed you any words, but you can mm -hmm. say that you felt 
that you were able to approach him, that he was somebody that yeah. was approachable. That okay, had so yeah, that's good. Uh, he is approachable. So the question is, what does my mentor mean to me and how did I pick him? How did you choose your mentor and okay. what does your mentor mean to you? How has he supported you? Okay. So working with Dr. Carpi has been really good. I, the first time I met him, he was very approachable and I think that's why I picked his lab because of the relationship that I was able to get the first day with him. He was very nice. He wasn't, I guess I was scared of a PhD mm -hmm. and I was scared to go into his office, but I felt very comfortable with him. So I picked his lab, and since I feel like it's the best decision I could have made, without him I wouldn't have been able to go to summer programs, I wouldn't have been able to now have graduate school interviews that I just got one two days ago. So having him along has been very good. He has mentored me very well, and I am very happy. What's your plan after you graduate? <clears throat> what do you want to do once you leave John Jay? So after I leave, I just, Sorry. So I just finished submitting all my applications for graduate school. I applied to eight programs. Hopefully we get some e well, I got. Hopefully I get some emails soon and I want to go to graduate school. I want to be a microbiologist. Okay, so let's let's start with maybe the end. Okay. I want to be a microbiologist and then go okay. back through the rest of it. Let's Okay. Um, after John Jay, I want to be a microbiologist. I want to study host pathogen relationships. Um, I just submitted all my applications, so we're, I'm waiting to hear back. Okay, let's do that one more time, and let's make it very specific that you're <coughs> applying to grad school. Okay. Can, can, I, can I say something? Mm -hmm. um, I think that you should mention that you're applying to PhD programs. Yes, it's very important. It's okay. not just a master's program. Yeah, okay. you're applying to, to, to PhD programs that you eventually want to become an independent research scientist Fantastic. as a microbiologist. Fantastic. Okay. So um, after John Jay, I want to become a microbiologist. I want to get a PhD in microbiology. I just submitted all my applications. I'm forgetting, oh, independent scientist. Okay, I'll start again, I'll start again. After John Jay, I want to become a microbiologist. I want to, I, uh, after John Jay, I want to become a microbiologist. I want to get a PhD in microbiology. I just submitted all my applications and hopefully when I'm done with my PhD I can become an independent scientist and conduct my own research, run my own lab. Discuss your research project. First in a statement your grandma would understand and after in scientific terms. My, so, pro my project on, is really simple. Hold on, hold on, hold on. <clears throat> I'm sitting down. Okay. My project is really simple. Can I just do the grandmother version? Like it's hard, like it's difficult to say it in a complex way. So I think that, let, let him just try it. Don't you think? Okay, so um, in Dr. Carpi's lab, I study anthropogenic sources. No, I don't, sorry. In Dr. Carpi's lab, I uh, study potential sources of mercury, anthropogenic sources of mercury using moss plants as biomonitors. So I have, so okay, so that's a complicated way. I'm thinking, cause I don't, I've never said it like, it's just so simple, it rolls off the tongue. So the easy way for my grandmother is in Dr. Carpi's lab, I look at mercury concentrations in the environment using moss plants. That's for my grandmother. And why do you why? do that? Yeah. Okay. The reason we look at mercury is because mercury is detrimental to human health and if there is a, some sort, mercury is detrimental to human health and if there's a source of mercury in the environment, it's important to pinpoint it and to detect it so that the proper regulation can be taken place. Next? What's next? That's it? Am I done? So you think your grandma would understand that? Absolutely not. <laughs> yes! Yeah? Like, I mean, yes. some metal in the air. So it's okay. something that's contaminating the environment. Yes. Let, let him riff for a minute here. Yeah. Okay, we're going to be quiet. Just talk about your research. Okay. That's, so, by the way, that's something I, you know, I know, but I didn't know. I, I didn't know there's metal in the air. Can well, you say, can you talk about that? Mercury is a metal. 
All right, I know, but it's I, not like you would think of that. Okay, right? so in Dr. Carpy's lab, I look at concentrations of mercury in the environment using moss plants because mercury is detrimental to human health, and we're looking to see if uh, there is a, if a specific power plant in New Haven, Connecticut is emitting mercury into the atmosphere. That's simple, right? Okay, so now the complicated version. Okay, so in Dr. Carpe's lab, we use in Dr. Carfee's lab, we use moss as a biomonitor to detect atmospheric sources of mercury. Nah, because you see, it sounds the same anyways. No, it doesn't. It's very different. I think it does. Just the fact that you mentioned there's a power plant. Specifically, you're trying to check if there's mercury there. Okay. What will you do with that research? And, and answer it as if she asked it. What will you do with that research? If you do detect mercury, what are you going to do? What's after that? Okay, so <clears throat> in Dr. Carpy's lab, I am looking at... No, no, I'm not asking oh. to start over. Just okay. that question that I'm asking you. Okay. If you find, if mm -hmm. you detect mercury, okay. uh, what will you do? So first, if we find, we first have to find that moss is sensitive enough to uh, absorb mercury in non-pristine environments like New Haven. And if moss is sensitive enough, what this data can tell us is essentially that this power plant in New Haven is, in fact, in being a mercury pollutant to the environment. So I guess local government can do something about that. I don't know. Just about pipetting, not about them laws. <laughs> oh, but then that makes you a lab technician. <laughs> No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. Fair. If I say I'm all about pipetting, <laughs> but I don't care about New Haven. I don't live there. So okay. So okay. So you're trying to figure out if moss yes can be used as a biomonitor. Uh, why? Why eh, moss? Eh. You why see, moss? so it gets a little bit. But if, why moss instead of something that may already be commercially because available? Because we've already seen that moss can be used. Okay, but why not use something that's already commercially available? Because moss is commercially available. You can buy that shit at Home Depot. Right. But why not something else that's more expensive? Because it's expensive. Ah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, all right. So in Dr. Carpe's lab, we're using moss, of inexpensive plant that you can buy at Home Depot, to detect an anthropogenic source of mercury. Anthropogenic means it is man-made. So we're looking to detect a man-made source of mercury in New Haven using moss. That's the money shot. Yay, we're done, right? That's good. You want to get out of here. I have an experiment <laughs> running at the moment. OK, so just take a second, everybody. Sit tight. Don't mm -hmm. move any papers, because we can hear them. Uh, and think, is there anything else you want to say? Do you want to uh, encourage people to uh, Mm -hmm. to, to study science through the PRISM. Why is PRISM program, why is it the best? Is it the best? You know, something, if you could think of okay. something to say to other people. I think as long as Raquel is in PRISM, people <laughs> should be willing to join. <laughs> okay, what about PRISM? Um, I've really enjoyed my time in PRISM. I think that you you get to develop a relationship with a lot of people that you usually wouldn't. I've been able to develop a relationship with mentors that I never thought I would be able to access these people. I thought these people were too busy to have time for me. But in PRISM, I've met professors before I had their class. I've met almost all my friends are directly because of PRISM. I've gone to conferences, and now new friends that I've made, I've met at conferences. and. This is all because of PRISM. So if you could join PRISM, I think that would be a good idea. <laughs> That's great. It would behoove you. I have a question, Raquel, that I'm, I'm dying to ask. It may not make it in the... Please. But it's... Um, I don't know if you agree that <clears throat> science is very suspect right now. People don't seem to value the facts. I don't value science, mm -hmm. okay? Okay. There's all kinds of science denial, yeah. right? So what are you, 
How do you think, what do you think about that as an emerging scientist? Okay. I like this question. I'm a fan. Can I have some water though? My mouth is really dry. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, I have right here. I'll take yeah, some. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm going to... I have to tackle this. This is an issue. All right, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, so... I think that the issue with people not believing in science comes from just them not having an interest at an early age. I think that a lot of people are not interested in science at all, and they become, they, I'm sorry, so, I know what I'm trying to say, but I need to get the words right, and I'm gonna get it. Hmm. Okay. I feel that people that uh, ignore scientific data and scientific fact are just, they don't have the scientific literacy that is necessary. They don't know how to read a paper. They don't know how to understand scientific publications. I feel that people that straight up neglect science are irresponsible because it's just a service to the world. It's specifically things like global warming nowadays, it's affecting us and it's going to affect the future very much. And for people to just ignore it when it's almost, it's pretty much consensus that global warming is a thing, it's irresponsible and I think that it stems from early education. I, I liked what you said that you know, people are not even interested in science and, and, and mm -hmm. yeah, that was interesting. Um, it's, I think the word is not that they neglect it or they ignore it, though that, that's true, they do. There are people that outright deny it. Yeah. Okay, so how are you as a... Because you, you don't seem to be interested in politics, and I don't blame, you don't have to be interested in politics. Mm -hmm. But how are you as a, as a scientist? What do you think is your ethical responsibility? Okay. I think that one way that we could change the way that people uh, ignore or neglect science, deny, okay. I think one way we can, uh, one way in which we can challenge the people that deny science is by directly showing them the facts and the knowledge that has been gained by doing research with things like, I guess, global warming and vaccines, people that don't do these things because they feel that they're detrimental to health. They're bad for the health of their children or whatever. I fucked up. No, you didn't. No, you're not. You're fine. You're good. Raquel. All right, hold on. You know, this not <clears throat> may not even get into this video, yeah. but I feel in a way that I'm I'm interested to hear what young people, young scientists mm -hmm. think. So don't even think that she's recording you. Okay. Yeah, you know, don't worry about it because we might make some other video, which is just purely kind of like a, a thought piece. Okay. You know, what are, what are young scientists thinking about this whole science denial issue? I'm very curious about it. Okay. So I think that one way we can challenge people who deny science is by directly challenging their views and showing them the data that scientists have collected that they completely reject and ignore as if it was baseless and has no merit. I think that one way we could do that is by challenging these people and by going to them with the data and explaining to them how this was obtained, what controls were used, how it was measured. And the way, if they understand the scientific process, then they might be able to accept the conclusions of a, of a study. And you think this has to take place at an early age a little bit to get exposed to what science is and how it's so, done? So, yes, I think, uh, I think science should be introduced much earlier than it is in a heavier way because it impacts us in ways, ways that it impacts us too much for us to ignore it as much as we do. For like the majority of the population doesn't really care for science. It's just there's like 1% of the population it has a PhD, maybe, in science, maybe. So a lot of people, it's, a very, it's very difficult, and that's why people feel that they should go away from it. But I think that people should 
there's probably an easier way to teach it or something. I don't know. Hmm. Okay, that was just for me. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm okay, very... Raquel, how about you? What would you say? What would I say? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to ask recording. you to go s sit over there. Oh my god, really? <laughs> yeah, why not? Oh my god. <laughs> I might have used this. Oh my god. Do it. I'm not ready for this. You look great. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> look yes, at me. You, you look terrific. <laughs> look at me. Oh my god. Okay. Yeah. So the same question, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think that as scientists, we have a responsibility to inform the public. I think that for a long time, um, we haven't, we haven't done that, generally speaking. So sometimes I hear the news and I hear a vague reference to some sort of experiment that's caused a big impact, but nobody really explains what that means. And so it becomes very abstract for the public and people don't understand the scientific process, right? So I think that tackling that from a young age is really, really important, but I think also as scientists we have um, this responsibility to to affect policy. So there's a lot of programs that are in place now, starting with the AAAS, which is the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences. They have a, a policy fellowship for scientists where a scientist gets paired up with a politician in Washington, and you work with them side by side, um, trying to help them make these decisions regarding science, regarding research, regarding funding. And I think that we have an important role to play in those positions. We just have to, we have to take that responsibility um, to be able to make that information known to the policymakers and to the public. What's the connection then? So, so I'm, I'm segueing into the connection between science and justice. I mean, you're at John yeah. Jay College of Criminal Justice. Yeah. So what's the connection then? What's the connection? to justice, I think we have a moral obligation. I think we have a moral obligation, right? This, is, this isn't something that only has an impact on my funding for my lab or for the future of my graduate students. This is gonna have an impact on mankind, right? On, on all humans. Um, and there's so much denial nowadays about things like global warming or, or things like vaccinations that have you know, no, no reason for being uh, denied, but yet people grab onto those things. And I think it's because they just don't understand. They just don't understand. Or sometimes it's just uh, perhaps maybe out of fear. People just don't understand and are scared and would rather <laughs> not have to face those realities. But yeah, I think, I think that if we, I, I think we have an important role to play, like you said, in justice um, at, at a policy level. interesting. Yeah. Do you think that this is a good question to be asking all of the students and the faculty members? Do you think that, I mean, the direction of the PRISM video. Yeah.